So I have this awesome job. I get to sort of imagine um, computer and social computing you know, in the future. And I think um, one of the things that, that I think about is how can we get more people to be more creative um, on the computer. So just a little poll, how many of you guys um, build stuff on techno using technology? Build stuff. And how many people can feel like those tools kind of enable you to do what you want? That's pretty good. Um, I feel like they, they aren't quite good enough. And I think, you know, I wish everybody was, was building more and feeling really um, more empowered by the computer. And so one of the things that I've done is I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a journey of, um, of what I've done in the past and how I think we can get inspiration for how to be more creative and, and merge um, design and technology better using other fields. I'm going to show you some stuff that we've been working on in the lab. Uh, so this is where I grew up. Uh, Yes, this is an aerial photo of Nebraska. And uh, anybody else from Nebraska? And those big circles are things that you can sometimes see out of the airplane. Um, there's a technology that's been introduced in, in farms, which is a new irrigation system. And it pulls water from the underground aquifer. And it pulls it up through a giant sprinkler. And it spins around like a huge clock. And it creates um, a great way to irrigate crops. But you can see a lot of land is wasted. And this technology doesn't really mesh um, with the way people live. Um, and the way the cities were originally laid out. This is a, a photo of one of these huge things. They're like three stories high. They're super cool. Um, and so when I was an undergrad, I studied architecture undergrad. And my thing was about how does this world, you know, which is the world of vernacular architecture, human scale, crops, merge with this world, which is sort of the future of cities and farming and, and agriculture and technology. And, um, and so, Urban designers have been thinking about this forever. So that first little square is a picture um, drawn by Vitruvius in Roman times of an ideal city. Of course, it's very regular. Um, and as architects kind of go throughout history, they've been trying to imagine what an ideal city might look like. And I think a lot of times architects really got it wrong. I mean, they tried to make everything really regular and formal. And if you think of the computer, I think the computing industry has done the same. Often. Um, you know, technology is a turn off to people because it, it feels very mechanical. And I just think this is really interesting because this is sort of a, um, a mid-century design of the future where you have a really modular sort of networked city. And so my thesis was designing a city that used that leftover space, remember, inside of those huge um, central pivots. And I wanted to build a city, kind of the most elemental city, that that l took advantage of that leftover space and worked with that design. And so um, this is like a little town of four families or a group of families. And if you kind of zoom in to where the families live, they have a shared space and a little farm space out on the side. And at one moment in time, like a big clock, everything aligns. You know, the pivot swings around and it lines up with that. And, and then that moment passes almost like the sun setting. And I just thought we could, you know, um, we should think about how we design public space and how people live um, and match it with the technology and really make it fit in. From there, I worked as an architect for a while. This is Canary Wharf, if any of you guys have ever been in London. Um, Canary Wharf was a huge city, in a sense, that was built on a pier. And when you're designing public space, um, that little circular space there, we tried to make it a place where people aggregate and, and gather. So if you think of Facebook, um, people gather there online. You know, Architects think of the same thing. And I think, for me, this, this kind of worked, because people blog about it, and they live there, and they like it. But I would rather live in London than in Canary Wharf. And so how do you bring kind of that texture and fabric um, into, into the spaces and things that we build? Um, a culture that I think has done um, an amazing job of this is the Japanese culture I worked as an architect in Tokyo. And this is just a picture of a column, pretty simple. But what they did, and you know, being here in this building with designed by Frank Gehry, you know, it's good, good inspiration. But um, a joint, a simple column, how can you make a joint in a column beautiful? You know, and I think um, this is probably my most favorite building in the world. It's the Todd Ullman shop in Omote Sando in Tokyo. And, what they've decided is, well, buildings don't actually have to have um, straight columns that are in a grid anymore. So he's actually built a tree-like structure for this building. So it's very organic. And a lot of the pictures you see of this building are always filmed with trees. And I just think it's a really beautiful idea that we could even rethink the structure and the way um, things are built. Because today, it's possible. You know, In the old days, it really wasn't possible. And so for me, when we think of computing and the future of computing, I think we need to look beyond our phones and our devices and look outside the world and really think about what, um, what might inspire us. 
um, and what other fields we can learn from when we're designing computers. Um, so I do a lot of work in social software. Um, so these are the words. I just tried to think of some words that I think of when I think of people being social. Um, it's all about emotion. You know, you love something, you hate it or not, you're sort of amused or bored. Um, and you talk to people and you have a lot of emotion. And um, one of the trends right now with social software is to kind of mine all the data coming out of these social systems like Twitter, Facebook, and to try to um, extract more value and meaning out of just the conversations that people are having. And so um, I think there's a tension, and I think it's, it's well articulated by Saka, who tweeted, you know, giving people advice on how to tweet, <laughs> dance like no one's watching, sing like no one's listening, tweet like no algorithm is coldly deciding your social worth. Right? So, and that kind of went around the web in, in that you know, viral sort of way. And so I thought, well, gosh, there's so much potential with all the world's information sort of being online. And these are sort of words that I think about with search. Um, machine learning, um, giving people recommendations, thinking about implicit actions, um, and how do we kind of combine these worlds together in a way that makes people still want to participate and love communicating and, um, and still take advantage of all the, the kind of value of technology. So that's a little bit of background. Um, so, so you guys have probably heard of Microsoft, and this is something that we make. It's called Word. Do you guys know Word? <laughs> Very exciting. Um, and so we've been thinking in the lab just how could we sort of reimagine everything on the computer? Because when Word was invented, it turns out that kind of the internet wasn't really in people's forefront. You know, and the metaphor is you have a piece of paper and a typewriter. <laughs> You type, and you can type something like, let's say I wanted to write a paper on yarn bombing. This is sort of my experience. Um, big blank page, and I can start typing. And for some, you know, some people, it's not really fun. Um, we've been looking a lot at how teenagers learn and how they start, um, how they really gain expertise. And they don't, they don't really start like this. They start on the web. They browse around. They search a bunch of how-tos in YouTube or whatever. They, they go look at their social networks. They just they look for stuff. So we thought, well, maybe we could do better than big blank piece of paper um, today. What if we rethought how you might create um, just something as simple as a document? So let give you a little demo. Uh, so this is a project called Montage, and you can actually try it out. But I'm going to, let's see, I hope the demo guides are nice. So I'm going to write yarn bombing. And what this does is this goes out to the web, hopefully, and it, it pulls together for me. It's just a search, in a sense. Like, you could search anywhere and get the same information, but it's going to assemble it for you in kind of a beautiful view. Um, so it's just bringing you all the information that you might want to know about yarn bombing, since, since we all love yarn bombing, because it's funny. Um, yarn bombing, in case you don't know, is you put yarn on stuff in cities and cause trouble. So, um, so I'm going to keep this one. And if I want to edit this, I can. So I might say, you know what? I don't really like the lacy chain link fence. So I am going to find you know, the phone booth, uh, maybe this tree, a bunch of other trees. I like this bike rack. Um, they had this one that I, I don't know, the bus, of course. You have to have a bus and a bowl. You know? And I'm going to save that. And then it's just going to change that for me. And I might want to resize these. I might not like this. So I'm going to delete that. Um, you know, This is a bunch of Twitter. Uh, Twitter feed. And so you can see that you know, if I want a different kind of thing, I could put a little visual or movie in there. And today, I think it's just really hard to create a, a web page, harder than it should be for most people to create something like this and throw it up there and share it. And so you can save this and tag it um, and just kind of make something beautiful, the yarn bowl. Um, and so that's just one experiment that we're doing on you know, how could you just change something that we might take for granted today, which you might just assume that creating a document is always going to use this metaphor of a sheet of paper. We could use a different sort of metaphor, and we call this uh, montage. I see. So, yeah, you can just go up and create them if you want. Um, so I'll kind of switch gears to another another topic. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's another one that I really love. Um, this is montage, sort of. If you view source on that montage page, this is the really exciting thing that you see. And um, we've been trying to get kids to code because I have this belief that if every kid could code, they'd probably have better job opportunities. And um, it's a bit of a turnoff for some people to see this and be like, that's really cool. Not. OK. <laughs> Especially uh, kids, I think, start believing they can't code by the time they're in about fifth grade because they know somebody who can code. And they decide they not only are they not good at math, um, but they, computers are for people who like this kind of stuff. And so they kind of get turned off. And um, 
So this is a, you guys have probably seen some of these stats. Uh, this kind of surprised me, even though I see a lot of stats, it really did surprise me. So there were 44 million college graduates um, with jobs in the US from 2009. And uh, you guys have heard of STEM, so it's um, science, technology, engineering, math. Um, of those 44 million, about uh, only 2.5 million women um, got degrees in those subjects. And of those, ones with jobs were only 0.6 million. So 44 million college graduates, which really isn't that many with jobs, only 0.6 million women have jobs in science and technology. So a lot of people get degrees, but maybe the jobs aren't that interesting. And I saw this, and I was like, oh my god, I'm a complete anomaly. <laughs> Why? You know, I just, I wish more people could experience maybe computing the way I've been able to, because even though I'm supposed to be the techno geek, I'm really not. You know, I, I studied architecture. I, I love design. I think that computing could be so much more. And how do we inspire kids and I let them see that? So we kind of took this challenge on and we thought, well, let's just reinvent programming. We can reinvent Word and the way you create documents. Maybe we should rethink how kids learn to program. And so we built this project called Kodu. Uh, Kodu is available for free either on the PC or the Xbox. And really all you need, you need an Xbox controller or a mouse. You don't actually need to know how to read. And it's kind of a point and click um, programming model. It's very visual. Um, this is a picture of it. So you can create games like these. So we thought kids, if you ask them what they want to build, they say, a game. They want to build one of those things that they play and they spend a lot of time in. And then you show them those big tech screens and they kind of go, uh, that's a lot of work, not interested. My kid, um, I have three boys, and um, the first one took programming class and decided he never wanted to program ever because it was way too much work to create an American flag. Um, it took him like three months and he hated it. And so I just thought that's horrible. That class demotivated him. And so how can we just excite people and motivate them and make them feel like they are empowered to create things by typing in a word, by using an Xbox controller. And so this is really our programming language. It says uh, if you're using the gamepad and you use the L stick, move this character quickly. If you use the keyboard, you know, do the same thing. If you use the mouse, move it forward. You know, so we have a very visual if sort of then when this happens, do this um, programming language. And we've um, had this out for a couple of years now, and kids are using it all over the world. It's been really awesome. I'll show you a little video in a second. Um, so yeah, you kind of, um, like I said, have this programming model, and you build these little 3D worlds with characters, and you give them behavior. It's not, our goal is not necessarily to teach programming. It's to inspire creativity um, on the PC or the Xbox, and to get people excited about building things, telling stories, you know, whatnot. My favorite story was I, um, I, I made everybody do this usability study. We had 20 kids coming into the lab. The guys who ran the study did not have children. Um, so they said, we have this all set up. It's four hours long. I was like, what? No, no, four hours long, yes. And they invited kids who were from the age of five to 18, which is bad, bad. And because it was Halloween, they had gotten lots of candy and free ice cream, OK? So I was so angry at them. I was like, I am not going. I am not three kids at home. I am not going to four hours. So I went the last two hours. And when I went, it was really amazing because every kid was sitting there with their little controller, even the five-year-old girl. You know, they hadn't even opened the ice cream. And they were, um, you know, they were making stuff. And they would see what other people were doing. And they were riffing. So I was like, OK. You, I was wrong, you know, it works. And so that's really great. Um, so just an example of the kind of games people can make. And let me just show you a little video of that. Video games. They're like an art form, like movies or books or TV. When you make a video game, you're making a story with characters and plots. But you're also creating a whole world for that story to live in. It's programming, but kind of like art, too. We used to think video games were really hard to make, but then our teacher showed us Cody. Instead of playing games, we're making our own games. We make up a story and work together to create a whole world around that story. simple to get started. Our teacher got us going in about five minutes. I thought programming was all lines of text and stuff. I didn't know it could be like a visual thing. I didn't know that creating stuff on a computer could be this easy. 
After playing around with coding, I think I might actually want to be a programmer someday. And there's a lot of people, as you guys probably know, looking at new ways of programming, but I just think it's sort of our duty to make it easier and more accessible to people to make things and be able to share them and be proud of the work that they make. So, um, so thanks. <laughs>